Okay, I think then we're going to begin session number four, which is going to be on uh, novel clinical research uh, in neuroendocrine tumor and future directions. Let's see if we can read the slides. Ah. So uh, with, the, uh, with the next session, we're going to begin the session with just a couple of questions. The first part of the session, I'm going to talk about uh, issues in clinical trial design, and then uh, we're going to move on to biomarkers. To open this part of the session, we have a, uh, we're going to take advantage of the audience response system. So if a, and we're going to pose a couple of questions to the audience about uh, the, clinic, uh, the interpretation of clinical research results. So if a study reports that patient receiving treatment A had a higher response than those receiving treatment B, and the study reports the p-value is 0.05, how should we interpret this result? Should we say the p-value is sufficiently low and we should trust the results and A is superior to B and everyone should receive treatment A? Or is it two, uh, there is a 20% difference in the response rate implied by the p-value. What is the number three? There's a one in 20 chance that the difference that is seen in this comparison between treatment in A and B could be due to random chance. Can we cue the music and uh, start the audience response? Wow, okay, I think we did very, very well. The, uh, so the correct answer is, uh, is three uh, on uh, that here. And I think we have one other question. So in another study um, that included 36 patients, neuroendocrine patients, uh, that reported a response rate of 69% for treatment A, it's a single arm phase two study. Uh, however, when other people tried to replicate these results, various different response rates were seen. And uh, these are also all very small studies. But for similar treatment response rate, when uh, there was attempt at replication, was 55% in one study, 40% in another, 39% in one, 36 in another, and then you also see 8%, 6%, 6%, all for the same treatment regimen. So the difference in these results are likely due to which of the following? Differences in patient selection and response criteria. Each of the studies were too small. Cumulative alpha error. So alpha error are false positive rates. A and B were all of the above. And we have the response. Okay, so we have a various different answers here between most commonly four and five. Uh, and I'll come back to this uh, question a little bit later in the, uh, in, in the session. Uh, but this is actually a real example. This study I refer to here was the original Mortel report for uh, uh, streptozoas and doxorubicin, where a 69% response rate was initially reported in a phase two study. All the other response rates were follow-up studies done by various groups in Europe and in the U.S. who re really reported response rate was almost a log difference in terms of uh, what the true response rate is. With that, I'm going to go into the uh, next part of the session. So why do we need to do clinical trials? Uh, since I'm coming from across the Atlantic, I will quote Mark Twain, who says, it's best to prove things by actual experiment than you know. Whereas you depend on guessing, supposing, and conjectures, we never get educated. And this is an area where I think we have made some major advances. If you look back in the past 10 years or so, I think we have moved away from retrospective series and small uh, phase two study into the era of large randomized phase three st uh, studies. Uh, nonetheless, I'm actually a true believer that we should learn as much as possible from every patient we treat. So I certainly have done my share of observational studies uh, in case series. 
But what are some of the limitations of observational study? Certainly one is that uh, in observational studies, we typically can see association. We're not able to really prove cause and effect. Be this is because hypothesis testing is really not possible, and there may be many intended, unintended biases in terms of selection and confounding variables. So I think many of us have heard doing this meeting already many times and in many other meetings that, for example, uh, patients who can have liver resection, uh, patients with neuroendocrine tumor who can have liver resection, do much better than those who cannot. So this is principally the, uh, observations through observational studies. But some of the uh, retrospective studies could be confounded by biases. For example, we say that we're going to take patients to surgery, but which of the patients here are we going to actually take to surgery? Certainly, it's not going to be this patient with a diffuse liver metastasis, 50 plus lesions. It's probably much more likely to be this patient who's young and only have two lesions in the liver uh, and uh, has a pancreas primary. But perhaps this patient will do well irregardless of whether you have surgery or not. Indeed, indeed this, this patient, although only having two liver lesions, was unable to have surgery because one of the lesions, although small, was right near the bile duct. So the surgeons declined. And actually, this patient received no treatment whatsoever between 2002 and 2010, a total of eight years of just clinical observation. Uh, so, in fact, these patients don't have the same biology. This is just to show that after 10 years, since this lesion has not changed, we actually need to prove again this is a real cancer and not just a cyst. So, an octreal scan here shows that indeed that's a viable uh, neuroendocrine tumor in the liver, but remain unchanged for eight years. So some other sources of potential unintended bias in retrospective studies could be uh, selection biases. So uh, one caution I would say is that often patients arriving at tertiary and quaternary referral centers are not the same as those in the general population. They may be a little bit different in terms of the performance status, organ function, even economics in terms of what is available to them. Because the worst patients the patients who are the sickest often are too sick to make it to the large referral centers, which may be quite a distance from them. Another caution about uh, retrospective studies in a case series is the possibility of censoring bias. So one of the issue is that if people are coming from a large distance away, uh, often they will stop coming when they get really sick. So the net effect of that is that we know how they're doing when they're doing well, and when they're sick and near death and near uh, and having their progression, they stop coming back to us. So this gets back to the thing we talked about before in the, yesterday, which is if you censor these patients because they don't come back anymore because uh, the loss of follow-up, then you may have informative censoring, which may make the, uh, the outcome a little bit better than what it really is. So we must. In, as much as possible, try to figure out ways to have complete follow-up on these patients. Another type of study I think we have to be cautious about are cross-sectional studies. There are various ways to do studies uh, in, retrospective, uh, in the retrospective sense. So one thing that's typically seen sometimes is, uh, is, is case series where people says, I looked at every single patient that in, that, that was in my clinic, that we saw uh, visit my clinic doing 2009. So what is the problem of this type of study? Uh, this is illustrated by this graph here. If you think about it, patients are uh, with differing type of prognosis are entering into your practice in a random order. Some of them will have very good prognosis and live a long time. Others may have poor prognosis and live a only short period of time. So if you don't do this correctly and you do it uh, and just say every patient that showed up in 2009 is that you end up excluding these patients with poor prognosis because they are not alive and they're not in your clinic at the time when you're doing the cross-sectional study. So one thing that we have to be careful about when we look at 
uh, outstanding results from a cross-sectional study is that you ask the question, did they really follow these patients at the time of initial presentation to the center? If they're only looking at who is showing up for follow-up or and not excluding uh, those patients are in long-term follow-up, then you run into the problem of having this, which is you, you'll end up excluding uh, patients with the worst prognosis. So that uh, gets me back to discussing prospective studies. Uh, as many of you know, there are various types of uh, clinical trials, uh, phase zero all the way through phase four. Uh, phase zero is essentially uh, small microdosing studies. We are tre treating patients with doses of drug that we know are not effective. And the primary reason here is to understand uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic. Phase one are dose ranging studies. Uh, these are usually to use to establish what's the correct dose and schedule and what's the correct route for administration of a drug. They're not usually, often not usually specific to a particular cancer. Uh, sometimes they are, but often they're not. Phase two are efficacy and safety studies. How a drug works in a particular disease, they're usually done in a particular disease setting and to understand whether the drug has any effect. Phase three are pivotal studies, usually comparing a new treatment to a standard of care. Uh, next thing about clinical trial is the, about clinical trial endpoints. Uh, what are the correct endpoints for clinical trials? Well, the way we usually think of these is that there are some endpoints that are self-evident good, meaning that overall survival, if a patient lives longer, that's a good thing. You don't need to prove anything beyond that. Other endpoints are surrogate endpoints. Response rate, for example, is typically thought of as a surrogate endpoint. Only reason we care about response rate is because usually people who have a response are likely to live longer. But there are many examples, for example, in gastric endocarcinoma and so forth, uh, there are regimens that have very high response rate but do not change survival in a patient population at all. And then we have things like progression-free survival, where some people think they're a surrogate endpoint, others think it's a self-evident good. The advantage of a progression-free survival is that it's the endpoint that's faster to obtain, but it is always the estimation meaning uh, the date of death usually is known very precisely. The date of progression is subject to interpretation of radiology and interval at which radiology is obtained. But there are some major advantages for progression-free survival in a disease such as neuroendocrine tumor, which we'll go into a little bit later. Other endpoints, uh, like time to progression, meaning that uh, we only care about uh, tumor growth, but if they die from a reason other than progression, perhaps from toxicity of drug, those are not included. These are generally less accepted by the health authority than progression-free survival. And finally, quality of life, I think, is very important. Uh, they're encouraged by the health authorities, although the role as a primary endpoint in oncology has not been well tested. Certainly, this is an area that a lot of work is being done uh, in terms of developing a validated quality of life instruments. Uh, the typical uh, way we, we measure these endpoints uh, in clinical trial these days is RESIST. There's RESIST 1.0 and one, RESIST 1.1. There are some minor differences. Uh, RESIST 1.0, for example, require all responses or tumor shrinkages to be confirmed, whereas RESIST 1.1 uh, does not require confirmation of responses unless it's the primary endpoint of the study. But typically, uh, there are um, they, they, up to 10 lesions are tracked in resist measurements, and, uh, and the complete response, all the disease disappears. Partial response, 30% decrease in the sum of linear measurements, tumor diameter, and progression is 20% increase in the sum of linear measurements. The one that's tip, the, 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 the one that's uh, the criteria that's typically used before uh, was the WHO criteria, and there are some major differences in terms of WHO and the newer resist criteria. This will have a major implication in terms of how we compare test uh, clinical trial results from older study versus new studies. 
WHO looks at cross-sectional area, so it's a product of the, of the radius uh, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the tumor. And uh, for response, uh, resist is, um, actually resist is based on just linear measurement of diameter. So for response, resist in WHO is the same. So when we say a partial response by resist with WHO criteria, what we're really saying is that we want a 65% with greater reduction in tumor volume because volume is proportional to the cube of the, di uh, the diameter or radius. Disease progression, however, by WHO and resist criteria are quite different. WHO criteria are calling progression when there's a 25% increase in the cross-sectional area. This corresponds to 40% uh, increase in tumor volume. Resist is calling progression at 20% increase in tumor diameter. This actually corresponds to a 73% increase in tumor volume because uh, this means that progression-free survival and time to progression that were uh, done using WHO criteria cannot be compared to the resist definition of progression-free survival or t uh, time to progression. So I'm gonna go into a little bit uh, about phase two studies. The primary uh, reason to do a phase two study usually is to estimate efficacy. Uh, the most common thing we see is really the reporting of response rate. Uh, however, I want to just remind us that although we typically talk about response rate of an agent and response rate of a regimen, what we're really talking about is the estimation of efficacy. Because we really only know the true response rate of a particular drug or regimen after we have treated an infinite number of patients. For a very small number of patients, the confidence interval for the reported estimation is going to be fairly wide. The primary endpoint is usually binomial, either response or no response, uh, a response rate. Uh, if the phase two study re uh, the reports were designed for progression-free survival, it's often done at progression-free survival at a given time point meaning we report progression-free survival rates uh, at six months or 12 months or so forth. Uh, phase two studies can be either single arm or randomized. Uh, the advantage of a single arm study is uh, usually smaller and more efficient. Uh, the randomized phase two studies uh, are generally used when historical uh, data is not reliable, or there's large amount of heterogeneity in terms of study endpoint. And this actually is very much true in neuroendocrine tumors because we, we have seen already uh, through the last day or so that there is a huge variation in terms of how these patients uh, perform with the neuroendocrine tumors based on histology and primary site. Phase two study design usually are designed based on a couple of different parameters. Usually you define a level of activity that is uninteresting uh, meaning if the response rate is less than such uh, and such, then we don't want to take this regimen uh, any further. And you define a activity level that is so interesting, you, you do not really want to miss the signal if it's really there. So that's H1, meaning if the response rate is greater than 30%, then we really don't want to miss, uh, miss the activity and take the study into it further. Uh, and then we have the associated false positive rate and false negative rate, which is the alpha and beta error. And these parameters together essentially then determine the size of the study. Most phase two studies are two-stage studies. They're designed in such a way to minimize the exposure of patients to inactive agents. There's assignment optimal design and min-max design. The assignment optimal design usually have a smaller first stage, but the total number of patients required in the phase two study is usually larger. The min-max design has usually a larger first stage, and, uh, but the total maximum number of patients that you need for the study is usually smaller. Uh, I actually favor the min-max design in rare diseases like neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, let me skip the slide. But there are some limitations to phase two studies. 
For example, if I pose this question, if we're going to study 10 new drugs in neuroendocrine tumors in various pathways, and 10 such phase 2 studies were conducted, each was 50 patients, and these studies have a fairly typical design. Uh, they say if the response rate is less than 10 percent, we're going to call them uninteresting. If it's greater than 25 percent, we're going to consider them active. And the type 1, type 2 error rate are 0.1 or 10 percent. And you, after these studies are done, six of these studies were declared active. So the question to be posed is, what is the probability that the drug is, uh, that's tested and declared positive is truly active? So actually, if you, you, one can answer this question uh, from a statistical standpoint mathematically. The way I would do this is that you can treat the phase two, uh, phase two study much as if it was a laboratory test that you ordered on a patient. That test is the phase two study itself, which has a certain false positive rate and certain false, uh, uh, false negative rate. Then if you apply the Bayesian theorem and uh, look at the uh, um, uh, positive predictive value, so what is the probability if the drug works that your trial is going to be positive, uh, then it is really just this formula here, which then you can expand further. So uh, the probability of the, the trial is positive when the drug is active multiplied by the prior probability that the drug will be active. So the prior probability the drug is active, you can know from historical data. What do I mean here? Well, if you're studying a drug in lymphoma, probably any drug you study will probably have a response rate and it will work. If you study a drug in pancreatic cancer, there's probably, you know, 20 agents studied, but only one of them ever got any sort of activity. Well, actually, in neuroendocrine tumors, the prior probability is fairly low. If you look at a long list of drugs uh, that has been studied previously and how many of them actually has received health authority approval. So this then is divided by uh, the same thing plus the false negative. Uh, so the, the probability the trial will be positive when the drug doesn't work and the probability that the, uh, the prior probability the drug doesn't work. So if we assume, uh, based on historical data, only about 10 percent of agents we toss into phase two studies for neuroendocrine tumor or pancreatic adenocarcinoma actually gets eventually health authority approval, then the, false pro uh, the, the prior probability the drug work is 10 percent. The prior probability the drug doesn't work is 90 percent. And the false positive and false negative rate uh, you know from the trial design. So if you calculate this, you'll see that in a typical phase two trial that reports a positive finding, only half of these drugs will actually make it into uh, when tested in large randomized phase three studies. Only half of these drugs will really actually work. What are some other reasons that we need to do randomized trials? So certainly one is the possibility of uh, uh, unintended biases. So which of these patients are we going to enroll into uh, large clinical trials? Often we tend to treat the younger patient, the Olympic, Olympian, a little bit more aggressively. And maybe we want to only do standard care like somatic analog for a frail 80-year-old. But then the caution is we cannot interpret the trial results against a large database like the SEER database. For example, if you look at the SEER database, this patient, the younger patient, simply because he's young, will have a much better outcome, median survival 76 months, versus an older patient where median survival is only 22 months. So we talked about this. So phase three study is really done for hypothesis testing. It uh, does hypothesis testing in probabilistic terms. It compares a new treatment to a standard treatment. So what happened in a phase three study is you set up a no hypothesis. The new treatment is not different than the standard tra treatment. And you compare the two arms. There's one other thing that we see from phase three study is that these are the study that generates the p-value that usually gets most oncologists excited. So what is the definition of the p-value? 
the p-value is actually the probability of obtaining a result that is extreme or more extreme than the one observed if the dissimilarity is entirely due to chance. Although we get excited about the p-value, p-value actually is only a part of the story. The more important part is actually that alpha error with the type 1 false positive rate for a study. This is because the false positive rate for a study is cumulative, meaning that the p-value is generated for each comparison you do, each analysis you do. Some study can have many analyses. So if there are interim analysis or multiple primary endpoints, the, uh, the alpha error is, is really, uh, is defines the cumulative uh, error rate for the study. Because p-value is generated for each analysis, increasing the number of analysis, uh, either because the interim analysis or multiple endpoints, uh, will actually increase the probability the trial will find something positive by random chance. The significant level is adjusted for the number of critical endpoints and number of interim analysis. So this is the reason why when, when we see large phase three studies being presented, often the p-value uh, that's, uh, that's, that's called significant, the critical value for, for the p-value is not simply 0.05, but some number that's much smaller than that often. So the sample size of a randomized phase three study is determined by the, uh, the total alpha error and the hazard ratio, the event rate uh, uh, between the old treatment and the new treatment, what the, how effective your drug is, the clinical uh, outcome, and the information fraction. So not every patient we enroll into a phase three study actually contributes to the data. That's why these, uh, the studies with adjuvant st therapy often require a large number of patients. And also, of course, the size of the study uh, is determined by the powerful desired uh, effect size and the dropout rate. So what about uh, endpoint for phase three studies in neuroendocrine studies? Well, this was a point that was debated at the recent uh, NCI neuroendocrine clinical trial planning meeting. At this meeting, we talked about progression-free survival and overall survival. And, and progression-free survival, it was recommended as the primary endpoint for neuroendocrine studies. Why is this? This is because survival in neuroendocrine patients after disease progression is usually quite long. For example, in the PROMIS study, survival duration after their progression event is greater than five years. And in the more recent radian 2, radian 3, and the sunitinib pancreatic neuroendocrine study, the, the survival, median survival after their progression event is greater than one year. When the survival after progression event is quite long, like this, what happens is that there could be a, quite a bit of noise and heterogeneity in terms of post-progression treatment that's off, uh, offered uh, to these patients. And these post-progression treatment, be it crossover with different treatment the investigators are offering, will confound any uh, survival outcome. So the other reason is that uh, progression-free survival and overall survival is the overall survival require many more patients. For example, if we wanted to detect a d improvement in progression-free survival from nine to 13 months, this is a hazard ratio of 0.7, and 450 patients will be needed if you want to finish the trial in three years. What happens if you're looking for a hazard ratio of 0.7 with 30% uh, reduction in risk of progression uh, in terms of overall survival? Well, this translates moving overall survival from 24 months to 34 months. And this means you'll either have to wait twice as long to get the data, more than twice as long to get the data, or increase the patient count to over 800 patients. What happens if uh, the risk reduction in overall survival is in a setting like more typical of carcinoid tumors or small, small bowel carcinoid tumors, where the baseline survival may be in the range about three to four years? Well, then you're gonna have to either wait nine years for your results or accrue more than 1,100 patients. But these are actually optimistic scenarios. It's actually unlikely a treatment 
that we offer that prolongs progression-free survival uh, by four months will prolong overall survival by a year. It's far more likely whatever progression-free survival advantage we see will be translated in absolute term into overall survival. In this scenario, same, same situation, if we have a drug that increase progression-free survival by four months and increase overall survival by the same four months, you will need 2,800 patients for overall survival endpoint compared to 450 patients for a progression-free survival endpoint. And if it's more like the more indolent situation, like for example, uh, small bowel uh, neuroendocrine tumors, that uh, four months improvement in overall survival will translate to a hazard ratio of 0.9 and you will need over 6,000 patients. So in rare diseases with such long survival durations, uh, that is the reason why we don't think overall survival are re reasonable endpoints. There may not be enough patients around to get these studies done. What about interim analysis? Uh, interim analysis allow for early termination of studies for either efficacy or futility. Uh, the number of interim analysis needs to be prospectively defined. The p-value has to be adjusted for the number of interim analysis to maintain the same false positive rate for a given study. Therefore, unplanned interim analysis are not allowed as they violate the assumption of the hypothesis testing. So remember, the health authority says they don't really care about the p-value. They said your alpha error has to be uh, either 2.5% or 5%. So of all the analysis you do, cumulatively, the false positive rate cannot be above 2.5% or 5%. So if you do more analyses, more interim analysis, then more likely you're going to have a higher false positive rate cumulatively for the study. So let me give you an example of this. An example of this is a recently completed study that was reported at ASCO, the NSABP COA study, which looked at the question of adjuvant uh, bevacizumab or Vastin in, uh, in colon cancer. The study enrolled uh, a large number of patients and compared Folfox times six months or Folfox plus bevacizumab uh, uh, times 12, 12 months. Median follow-up was three years. 2,700 patients were accrued. Uh, and the endpoint was disease-free survival. Hazard ratio uh, was 0.75, meaning they were looking for a 25% decrease in the risk of uh, the disease recurring. This is the final study result. You can see there was very little difference between the two arms. The study was declared to be negative. The p-value was 0.15, and the disease-free survival rate at three years was 77% versus 75%. Then the investigator did something very interesting. They went back and said, we looked at the data at three years. What would we have seen if we looked at the data at an earlier time point than our original plan? Well, it turns out if they looked at the data at one year, the study would have been declared wildly positive. The hazard ratio will be 0.6, and the p-value will be 0.0004. And, but as the study matures, uh, and you look at uh, 1.5 in two years and three years, all the statistical significance would have been lost. So this is the danger of looking at the trial data too early and doing un unplanned interim analysis. So uh, I'm going to end by posing a, a, a question to the group. So suppose you have a patient in front of you, and you're going to enroll this patient in a randomized phase three study. And the progression-free survival is a primary endpoint. And crossover is allowed at a time progression. So you enroll this patient. The patient could have gotten the treatment or placebo. And after three months of treatment, the tumor is growing at the same rate as it was growing before meaning that it's not growing very fast, but still increasing in size. And so the treatment may not be doing much for this patient, but it has not met uh, uh, the resist progression criteria. What would you do? Let's cue the music and have the group uh, take a vote. Mm -hmm. 
we are convinced the drug is not doing anything for this patient. But what is the implication here? Keep the okay. That's great to hear. So let's take a look at this. So one way you can ask the question is, well, we don't think it's working for the patient. What's the int best interest of the patient versus what's best interest of the protocol? But another way to look at this is that if you take the patient off early at this point, you're essentially taking the patient off before the progression occurs. So you're artificially then inflating the progression-free survival on the arm the patient is enrolled. Because this patient, because the tumor is growing, if you kept him on the study, would have very likely met the progression criteria next time you scan them. By taking him off right now, you would have prevented the patient from seeing, the uh, central radiologist from seeing the progression event. So then, really, another way to phrase this question is, you know, for, the, for this patient, probably continuing the treatment may not be adding much to him. But the date, integrity of the data would, will make sure that, uh, ensure that all future patients will be treated based on the best data available. I don't know what the right answer is for this patient and what we should do, but I think we need a design study with reasonable endpoints so we don't meet uh, such dilemmas. And, uh, but we also need to ensure uh, that the integrity of the data so future study, future patient can be treated based on the right data. So in the, uh, in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna end my presentation here.